things. Right. I will get started. I can see we got lots and lots of attendees. Carissa, this is very exciting. A whole list of people who have who are joining and still joining. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Frontline Club Online. I'm Ramit Navai. Uh, before we get started, um, forgive any technical blunders in advance. They will be entirely my fault. Um, just to go through the order of events, I'll be chatting to Clarissa for about 40, 45 minutes, then we'll take some questions. So to take questions, uh, you can raise your hand. If you toggle here, you'll see a Q&A section. You can either raise your hand or you can send in a question by typing it in the little box here. Um, and we will hear you when I unmute you. So we will hear your voice, but we won't be able to see you. Gosh, we've got lots of attendees now. So I think um, people are notoriously late to our Frontline Club events. But, uh, <laughs> journalists. Um, but let's, let's get started. Um, did I introduce myself? I'm Ramit Navai. I am delighted to be talking to Clarissa Ward this evening about her book, On All Fronts, The Education of a Journalist. Now, for those of you who don't know Clarissa and her work, she's CNN's multi-award winning uh, chief international correspondent. She is outrageously talented, uh, multilingual, very, very witty, and that all comes across in her book, which I devoured in a day. It's a witty, intimate, honest portrayal of her life as a foreign correspondent and war reporter. Welcome, Clarissa. Thank you so much, and thank you for such a gracious introduction. I'm very excited to be here with you. So Clarissa, this isn't just a book about war reporting. Um, there's a lot in it about your childhood, about your parents, who, by the way, my God, they're hot. Um, <laughs> but your, about your personal romantic life. Yeah. Why did you decide to write it that way? I guess, you know, it's such a good question. Um, I mean, for me personally, when you're writing from a, per a perspective of like your actual experience, uh, it makes it easier to write, it flows. You were there, you felt it. And it's a big part of who you are and what shapes your identity. So often as journalists, we're so kind of obsessed with this mask that we wear, right? We're neutral observers. We're um, always on the sidelines. We're never injecting ourselves into our reportage. And I think we're beginning to see more and more that that's not really the case. We will have biases that are a product of our upbringing, our race, our religion, whatever it may be that we bring to the table. And so I think in the process of like really sharing my story and how I developed as a journalist, it wasn't really possible to do that in an authentic way if I wasn't willing to be really honest. And sometimes it's a little uncomfortable for me to write about those things, not so much my sort of failed love affairs with Lebanese playboys, because that's actually <laughs> rather humbling and quite amusing, I think. But certainly writing about some of the other parts that I've, you know, parts of this job that I've struggled with more, that is hard uh, and it is personal. But I think if you're gonna really do it and go for it and, and, and write something and put it out there on the record, then you have to be willing to put yourself on the line a little bit. Because if you're only telling half the story, then what's the point in telling the story? And how do you think your childhood did shape you to become a roving war correspondent? And you talk uh, in depth and really succinctly, actually, about this particular tribe of people. What makes somebody become a war correspondent and mm. what makes a dogged foreign correspondent? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the word you used is interesting, roving, right? And roving is definitely something I was doing a lot of as a kid. I was grew up in this sort of bizarre hybrid world. My mother is American. My father is British. We lived between New York and London. They were both complete workaholics. I was an only child. And so I spent a ton of time on my own. And that meant that I had a very active imagination. I spent a lot of time telling stories, watching TV, reading. And I was sent to boarding school at a very young age. Uh, coming from the US, it was one of these like crazy stringent British boarding schools. I was 10 years old and you know, I mean, there were just rules upon rules upon rules and I was completely miserable. 
But I soon realized that I needed to just immerse myself in the culture of it if I wanted to survive it. And weirdly, I think that was a useful lesson to learn at a young age, because when you're doing this job and you're living in Beirut and Baghdad and Moscow and Beijing and loneliness is such a huge part of the experience of a foreign correspondent, you need to be able to immerse yourself in the experience and kind of surrender to it and go with it and, and be something of a chameleon and, and, and take on something of the persona or the place that makes it more manageable and less lonely. So in a, in a strange way, I think that it really did sort of prepare me for this work. Um, and I was also very lucky we traveled a lot when I was younger. My dad moved to Hong Kong when I was 14. And, and so we would go on these journeys. And I think also my parents are like very, uh, what's the word for it? I'm trying to think of how to say it like generously. Like they're quite unorthodox. So nothing really would surprise them in terms of what I wanted to do, as long as I felt passion for it. And as long as I, it was something kind of interesting, they were, they were very, very supportive of it. Although obviously it takes a while for any parent to get used to the idea that your child is going to be working in dangerous places. But um, yeah, it's not the obvious training of a foreign correspondent, I guess, but it, it taught me to be adaptable and self-reliant and curious, I think. You mentioned uh, the stresses of the job, and I love the way, actually, you were really honest talking about the stresses uh, that we can face and how you coped with the stresses. I do think that people in our business can be quite macho um, about not wanting to talk about the stresses. But what I was particularly interested in isn't the pressure that we put on ourselves. It's the pressure that we get from often somebody sitting in an office who hasn't been in the field mm. for years and years and years. Do you think that pressure on us when we're in the field, sometimes doing dangerous jobs, is justified? And also, I would love to know um, if now you have success, you face the same pressure or are you able to push back? I mean, I think it depends what kind of pressure you're talking about exactly. Uh, there is definitely a lot of pressure when you're in the field to get the story, right? You got to get to the place and get as close as you can to the story. And no one cares that you haven't slept in four days. No one cares that you're sleeping on the floor. What I would say, I've been fortunate to work at places where everyone cares a lot about security. So if there was a moment where someone like me is like, for real, this is not an acceptable situation or this is unsustainable or too dangerous or whatever it may be. I think that people would, would hear me out. I think the, the other pressure that you face a lot that is a bit hard is it's like you're broken with exhaustion and it's like, I, I need you to file this. And you're like, oh, I really just need a break. I need a rest. And, um, and often it's like, Mm, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, or, or they, you know, finally be like, yes, okay, but, and then you feel so guilty about it that you end up doing it anyway. I think that's why I love television because you work as a team in TV. So it's not just about what do I feel? How am I responding to the pressure? And this is the reason I could never work in print. Well, that's one of several reasons, but uh, you know, when you're, when, there's a collaborative process in television. So we're all sitting together and it's like, how do we feel about this as a team? How are, how's everybody's energy levels? How's everybody's hunger? Like, have you eaten today? Um, are you concerned about something? Are you comfortable with the security situation? And so you can take those decisions as a team. And it also makes it much easier um, when you do want to push back and you do need to push back when you have three or four people or at least two or three people doing it together, you feel a bit more security and strength in, in pushing back on, on the execs or management and saying, you know what, we have had a conversation about this together and we have decided we're not going to drive to that place or we don't think that's safe or we don't think that's actually what the interesting part of the story is. We think this is what we should be going for. So I think you do need to stand up for yourself, absolutely but it does make it a lot easier to do that if you are working with other people and it can be a group decision as opposed to just you. And obviously I'm saying that now at the age of 40 years old in the position I am in and now, when I was 28 and you know running around in Baghdad with no idea what I was doing, I wouldn't have even known how to push back because the only message I had always been given was never say no. 
Yeah. Never say no. You always say yes. You always put your hand up. You always get out of bed and do that live shot. You always miss that wedding. You always miss that funeral. You always say yes. Um, I'm not going to ask you the question that we have discussed that we get asked a hundred times, which is <sighs> so boring, which is what's it like being a, a woman in this <laughs> world of war correspondence. What I'm far more interested in is the stuff that you've written about which is actually how we're perceived within our own industry and sexism within our own industry. And you talk about having your hair discussed, mm. my hair discussed as well. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you think this has changed post Me Too? And again, do you think this has changed since you've had more success? Mm. So I definitely think great strides have been taken. Absolutely. I mean, I remember, and the person will remain nameless, but I remember someone in Baghdad when I was 25 years old calling me sugar tits, right? And it was kind of funny, right? And I certainly didn't make a fuss about it. But in this day and age, like, hell to the no, no one's calling you sugar tits in, in the Baghdad Bureau or any bureau, right? So I think that we have definitely uh, made strides and evolved. I think that what remains and lingers are two things. First of all, I would say there is a, sort of, you know, a reality when it comes to television that it is fundamentally a superficial medium, right? You can't really get around that. You are on screen. You are telegenic or not telegenic. It doesn't even matter if you're beautiful, but you have to command the screen, right? And naturally, with women, there is going to be more emphasis on your actual physical appearance. How does your hair look? People found it so weird that I wore my hair up for years, even though we were in Baghdad. <laughs> it was still so weird that I wasn't spending all day blowing it nicely with my, you know, non-existent hair dryer. Um, and again, you know, comments of you should wear a dress or you should wear this or you shouldn't wear that or you should do makeup like this. And I think that that is a little bit better now, but it still has a long way to go. I still think that we see far more men over the age of 50 on television or on, you know, in documentary films even than we do women over the age of 50. And I do still think that this insidious pervasive misogyny is, is around, it's there. And it's much more subtle than it used to be. I'll get invited to the conferences in Washington, DC. But I can't tell you how many times, and, and maybe you've experienced this as well, where you're like sitting with a group of middle-aged white men who are kind of mansplaining to you about, you know, the, the conflict this or the geopolitics of that. And you're like, wait, I'm the only one who's been to Aleppo at this table. And you know what's so awful about it, Ramita, though, is that actually, and I don't know if this is a personal thing or just the way we as women often are made to feel, you end up feeling insecure and a little bit nervous and doubting yourself and like, maybe I don't really belong at this table. Maybe I don't know as much as these men sitting in Washington. And that for me is the kind of the sort of ugly side of it. It's like, I, I could care less if someone calls me sugar tits in the office. I mean, whatever, it's, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but, um, I don't, it's not going to bother me. But when I think of girls who are starting out or younger women being made to sort of doubt themselves or feel insecure about themselves or having their ideas or their experiences dismissed because of kind of uh, misogynistic attitudes, that bothers me a lot more. And I still think that's uh, out there. If anyone deserves a place at the table for covering conflict, Clarissa, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> On a serious note, I want to move on to your coverage of Syria, which was dogged and brave, and I was in awe of. Uh, how many times did you go back to Syria? Well, I just want to say, first of all, that's particularly nice coming from you because your work in Syria was so extraordinary, and I was very much following in your footsteps, and you were so gracious um, before my first trip, and I'm very grateful to you for that. And uh, for aspiring journalists out there, it is so important to look out for each other and help each other and don't be greedy or selfish, like collaborate because you always pay it forward and it comes back to you in the long run. But I have done, I guess now it's about 12 trips into Syria since the uprising began. Now you start your book with Syria and it's threaded all the way through. Um, and 
you have given testimony at the UN. Um, I think your coverage of Syria is a historical record. Um, we're talking about the education of a journalist. What did covering Syria teach you? I mean, you know, I think there's always one conflict you cover that just rips your heart out and doesn't let go. And, and not just for the obvious reasons, which are, okay, you are witnessing Syrian uh, absolute unmitigated horror and suffering in Syria in a way that maybe you didn't have quite that intimate up close look at that suffering in other conflicts, certainly that I had covered. But it also was where I sort of met my match in terms of understanding what my role is as a journalist and what my function is, what my work was supposed to achieve and what my limitations were on a personal level in terms of being able to go the distance and, and sustain that dogged, thank you, uh, your word, commitment to the story. Because when you're younger, there's a temptation to be, I want to go and do really great work and make a difference, right? How often do we hear that? I want to make a difference. I want to make a change. I want to improve the world. And, and these are all really noble ideals. And I'm not telling people that they shouldn't have them. But then you go and you cover a war like Syria, and there's not so many journalists who are covering it from the rebel side. And you're putting out some really strong material and you're showing the world, hey, look, children are being killed, civilians are being targeted, hospitals are being bombed, villages are being gassed, and the world is still standing there on the sidelines, wringing their hands, or certainly the Western world. And you realize it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how hard I try, how much I risk my life, how many friends I lose in this conflict. I am not able to alter the course of history with my reporting. And on the one hand, that is a sort of heartbreaking moment where you're like, well, what the hell am I doing here risking my life? And then on the other hand, for me, it actually became a very liberating moment because it forced me, I got to a stage in Syria where I was way too immersed and involved and emotionally attached and sort of straddling that line between journalism and activism, frankly, um, which I don't have regrets about because I think there's certain conflicts like you're gonna just go for it and say what you see and, and, and not mince words about it. Um, but also because I was realizing that I, I could not keep giving a, of this emotional and uh, physical intensity to this conflict if I, can, if I was operating at that place. So what it forced me to do was to sit with, well, first of all, to go to a therapist, which, you know, frankly, I still don't understand how this is like a taboo in this industry. It's like everybody doing this work, unless you're a sociopath, should probably see a therapist at some point. But then also have a think about why you're doing this work and what it really means. And I had this eureka moment when I suddenly realized my job is not to solve the problem. That's not my job. That's not my responsibility. My job is to shine a light on the problem and give a voice to the people who are suffering and make a record that hopefully maybe one day can be used to help prosecute war crimes and to allow people to feel that their story has been told and that you know someone has been bearing witness. My job is not to come up with the prognosis for how to deal with the Syrian war, how to end it. My job is not to prescribe intervention. None of those things are my job. And once I understood my role in a much more humble and focused way, it was so freeing because it was like, oh wait, I don't have to carry all that extra baggage that I haven't been able to save the Syrian people. It really sucks that I haven't been able to, but it wasn't my responsibility. And frankly, it was sort of ludicrous that I ever felt that it should be. Yeah, carrying that guilt. Yeah. And yeah, and this is survivor's guilt thing too. You know, people often assume that the hardest thing about the work that we do is being in dangerous places and seeing terrible things. I actually think what's harder is coming home and feeling like an alien from outer space because your heart is still in another place. You can't understand how it is possible that just because I have this passport, 
I'm able to now sit in the south of France with some friends drinking rosé by the pool and children are still being pulverized under the rubble in Aleppo. Like on what planet is that okay? Like that's the part that is so difficult to reconcile and, and make peace with and learn how to navigate that straddling of worlds. Um, for me, taking on that thought, I, I found that, and I think talking to quite a few of our colleagues, that we do have a tendency to become more cynical, mm -hmm. either in order to cope with that, to cope with carrying that guilt, or we've just become a little bit inured and hardened. But mm. how do you balance cynicism with wisdom? That's such a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of gallows humor as well. Cynical. Has this yeah. work, work made you cynical? I think I would love to say no, but there is no question that you have to become a little bit cynical in order to get through it frankly, in the same way, and I often compare this work to the work that trauma surgeons do. We're not saving lives, but if you see a doctor when they're there in, in the thick of it and doing triage and like, you know, no one's shedding a tear in that moment for the terrible thing. You're just, you got to get the work, get it done and get out. And that's really your only focus. And, and in order to do that, you have to be able to shut off parts of yourself and compartmentalize. So I think that cynicism is sort of inevitable but i'll tell you where i think it becomes dangerous and mandatory to avoid it cynicism where you then feel like oh i don't, I don't really want to do that story anymore it's like no one's going to care about it and everybody's already done that and what's there left to say about that no that's called being lazy and cynical that's a nasty combination your job as a journalist is to keep going back and telling stories and finding fresh angles and finding new voices and finding creative ways to tell a story, to keep people engaged, to keep the message out there, to keep bearing witness. That's your job. It's not just to run from adrenaline hit to adrenaline hit to adrenaline hit, because that really is unsustainable. So I think everyone has to find their own way of trying to keep fresh eyes to a certain extent and keep trying to bring that youthful vigor and enthusiasm and curiosity to every single story you do. And obviously it doesn't always happen, but for me, that's what sort of separates the wheat from the chaff a bit. How is your journalism maturing as you cover more stories? Well, I think, I think that there's a number of ways. First of all, I would just say on a skill set level, um, I'm learning so much more about the way technology can allow us to do incredible things about, you know, when I started out, we didn't have drones, right? And now we're like obsessed with drones and want to put them in every single piece. Uh, so we're definitely thinking a lot about different creative ways of telling stories in terms of the technology that's available. And if you're doing investigative work, you're looking at Bellingcat and thinking, okay, how can I get one of those courses that they're offering to learn how to do reverse Google images and all the other brilliant, I mean, that's really like the most basic skill, even I've got that one, but to learn the sort of, you know, the skills, the tricks of the trade in order to be able to delve deeper and, 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 and do that kind of really important work. And then I think there's an understanding of, you know, the changing of the zeitgeist, right? It used to be in America, particularly, that there were three white guys who came on at 6.30 at night and you felt like you knew them because you saw them every night and they told you the way the world was and they told you the way America was. And it didn't really matter where you were from in America. You just knew that these three white guys were right and everything they said was true, right? And now we understand that, well, it's not that they were lying, but they had one perspective. That was one view. And we are much more open as a result of social media to the fact that there's a whole vibrant array of diverse voices and we are incorporating that more and more into our storytelling, which is tremendously exciting, but it's also a huge challenge because what it means is that as a journalist, you're suddenly facing 
this cacophony often of opposition or you're facing concerted efforts at disinformation or trolls or whatever it may be. And I do think that young journalists starting out have their work cut out for them, trying to navigate this minefield of when do you respond? When do you engage? How do you know, you know, what is, what is neutrality versus truthfulness? And what's more important? And what's the relationship of, you know, objectivity to the story? And what, these are all the kinds of questions that I think those of us who have been doing this for a while are really asking ourselves a lot and, and trying to understand, particularly as we look forward to what the future of journalism is going to look like at this frankly, a uh, crisis point whereby so many people in the world have very little faith anymore in these institutions. So I hope that I am becoming a little bit more mature in addressing some of those issues and learning when to um, stand up for your rights and, and fight those battles and learning when to ignore some of the trolls or tune out some of the noise and stick to your guns and stick to your your instincts now this isn't this isn't an original question but i've heard you speak about this and you speak about it so well and i think it's a really important question a really important issue that you just touched on and it's in this post-truth world of fake news and disinformation uh campaigns to what extent has that affected your work and you being part of the mainstream media? Mm. Um, hugely. There's no two ways about it. I mean, we all want to take the attitude of rising above it, I'm sure. But how do you rise above it when, you know, the president of your own country is calling you the enemy of the people? How, how do you respond to that? How do you then respond to the ripple effect that that has across the world particularly in authoritarian regimes, whereby it's considered open season on journalists now. Who respects journalists anymore? They're vermin, right? And I remember the, the start of it for me when I really started to feel it was actually when I was covering Syria and I would be you know, on the front line in Aleppo, risking life and limb to try to tell these really important stories I felt about, you know, frankly, a massacre of people. And I would go on Twitter and everyone was like, you're an Al Qaeda loving whore and this and that. And, and you're like, what? How, how on earth do I even respond to that? Like, how is that your takeaway from what I just showed you or told? And so in the beginning, you're, you're, you're furiously engaging. And I, I'm sorry, I don't love Al Qaeda nor am I a whore, but like, let's just tackle the Al Qaeda thing for now. I mean, you know, and so you find yourself, and then I'm like, wait, I just gave this guy with an egg as a profile picture, 500 followers by engaging in that chat with them. Um, and so you very quickly have to kind of pivot and think, okay, how am I gonna respond to this? How am I gonna respond to it when I, you know, travel in these countries and people have like very little respect often for journalists anymore. How am I gonna to respond to it when I'm sitting having a dinner in London? This is before I worked at CNN, I worked at CBS News, only seen in the US. I was having a private conversation with my Russian ex-boyfriend. And um, the next morning I wake up and some lunatic had been sitting two tables away from me and was like, I was sitting next to you at dinner last night. I was sitting next to Clarissa Ward at dinner last night and it's plain to see that she hates America, okay? Which first of all is like ludicrous. But secondly, like, what do you do with that? How do you respond to that? These are all frivolous, silly things, right? They're not important in and of themselves, but they are indicators of a much more sinister and insidious shift that we've seen towards the sort of absolute systematic discrediting of the mainstream media. And the thing that I often try to explain to people, because I've been doing a lot of investigative work on, on Russia's involvement in this and disinformation, is that the goal of a lot of this disinformation is not necessarily to get you to believe, you know, climate change is a hoax. It's to bombard you with so much crap with so many different opposing, ludicrous, wild, over-the-top ideas uh, and statements 
that your average consumer of information feels totally overwhelmed, throws their hands up in the air and says, you know what, forget it. None of it's true or all of it's true. I don't know, maybe truth doesn't exist. And the minute you have a society that is willing to do that, to say maybe truth doesn't exist, that's really when you're opening Pandora's box. That's a really dangerous inflection point. And so I try to keep that in the back of my mind because sometimes I feel tempted to just throw it all in the air and say, well, I can't be bothered to do this either if people are just gonna attack me and criticize me and uh, malign me. And if I'm gonna every single time I do a radio interview about my book end up you know, with some guy uh, banging on about CNN for half an hour. But that's what keeps me going. It's like, no, we need to tune out the noise, stick to the facts, keep telling the stories, and I do think this madness um, will settle eventually, I hope. Um, Larissa, you're getting lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to restrict my, I've got so many more questions for you, but I'm, I'm gonna scale it down now because you've okay. got a lot of questions to, to, to cover. Um, what do you think are the major issues that will be part of the next 10 years of your education? Throwing mm. That's a really good question. Um, you know, people have been asking me a lot, like I'm technically on maternity leave at the moment. They're like, when are you coming back from maternity leave? And I'm like, it really depends who wins the election <laughs> on Tuesday. And I sort of feel the same way about that question. Uh, it's very rare in fact, I can't think of any other time when I have been, would find it so difficult to predict with any uh, degree of confidence what the big stories or big educating factors will be in the next 10 years. I think without a shadow of a doubt that the, the most seminal event that got me into this was 9-11. The only thing that I have seen on par with 9-11 in my you know, brief, whatever it is, 15 years as a journalist or 20 years as a journalist is um, this global pandemic, the coronavirus. I think we are similarly as with 9-11, where I think for like almost the first year, we were like, oh, we're going to war and we're doing this, but we still didn't really have a sense of like what the implications, what the ramifications would be of how much things were changing and the ways in which they were changing. I feel the same way now about COVID. We know fundamentally that this is going to change the nature of our societies in a very real way. Um, and particularly in terms of how we relate to each other, how much we travel, globalization, these types of things. But we don't yet fully have a sense of what that will look like exactly, what those changes will be, what those differences will be. So, but I think in terms of the stories, more broadly speaking, that are going to be around for certainly the next five years, if not the next 10. Um, China, uh, if you're a correspondent for a US network, but frankly, for any network. I think China and a possible Cold War with the US is going to be a big, big story. I think um, depending on who wins the election, potentially the continued rise of populism could be a big, big story. Um, and I think without a doubt, the way the world responds to the coronavirus and what happens when the vaccine comes out, everybody is so breathlessly wrapped up in covering who's gonna get the vaccine first as in who's gonna you know, market it or create it or put it out there first. What's more interesting to me is who's gonna get it first as in all the world's inequalities laid bare, like which citizens will be the first recipients and how, how will it be distributed when we know that there won't be enough to give it to everyone? And, and what does that do to this sort of already gaping chasm between the first world and the third world? And how does that affect re relations? And um, I'm very interested in seeing what, what, what that will look like. Larissa, forgive me for asking this question because I hate it when people ask me this about Iran and they always ask me this about Iran um, and it's to predict what will happen, but you are the best placed person to predict what you think will happen in Syria. Do you see an end in sight? Um, no, no. I think the best case scenario for Syria right now 
is no peace, no war. So um, I cannot see how there can be a meaningful peace agreement with the status quo, but I do think we're seeing less of the um, militarized violence every day. That's not to say we're not seeing it, we are, but not anywhere near the scale that we did before. So it's possible that through a kind of stalemate, we'll see a continued reduction in the violence. But in terms of a roadmap out of this, you know, you have two thirds of the country controlled by Assad. Then in the north, you have, you know, the Turks with 20,000 troops in Idlib. You have the US with their couple hundred, but they still have, you know, at least some skin in the game, let's say. You have the Kurds up in the, I mean, how on earth do all these parties sit down and have a grown up conversation about how to get out of this? And how on earth can that conversation really begin? while Bashar al-Assad is still in power. And I think even the Russians understand that he is you know, not really going to be able to lead that country into a new era. And yet they are committed to him because they also fear that if anyone else was to come in his place, even if it was someone they handpicked, that the state would collapse. And that for them is the absolute priority is to ensure that the state doesn't collapse. But as long as Bashar al-Assad is in power, and as long as there's absolute impunity, um, you know, and no justice at all for any of these war crimes and the, the hundreds of thousands of people killed and half the population displaced from their homes, I mean, how on earth can we talk about peace? I mean, we're just, we're just not even close. Oh, on that slightly depressing. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, let's go to questions. Um, okay, forgive any technical hitches. Again, it will be entirely my fault. So I'm going to answer Owen Johnson. I hope you're ready to answer live. Let's try this. Owen, I think you have to unmute. Are you there, Owen? No, maybe this isn't going to work. So I will ask you on Owen's behalf. Um, Owen says you really are reporting for two different networks. Uh, one is CNN, the other is mm -hmm. CNN International. Yeah. How do you deal with it? Does it make you schizophrenic? <laughs> um, you know, Owen, I'm not going to lie to you. It is really challenging. Um, in many ways, it's great, right? Because if I have a story that I'm passionate about, and it might get a couple of runs on domestic, but there's a lot of US politics or whatever, and, and it's not a very accommodating news cycle. And it's wonderful that my work gets to air many more times on CNN International, and that it gets to air all over the world, which is, is such a huge privilege after working for US networks for all this time, whereby people never get to see your work. So that is the plus side. The downside is, let's say I'm doing lives on Brexit, right? The live shots that I will be doing for CNN Domestic are really radically different than the ones I would be doing for CNN International. Because for CNN Domestic, we're talking like 90 seconds, bare bones, this is the latest, this is the deadline, boom. Whereas for CNN International, it might be a five minute segment um, much more in depth, sort of Q and A style, and so it's hard because you're. It's almost like you're doing two totally different stories, even though they're technically all the same story. One requires a very different approach to the other. That's similarly true when you talk about, um, you know, tape pieces, right? How do you stylistically accommodate the needs of both networks. I think there's a growing realization with all the demands on us in the field that like, frankly, we just, you, you do it how you would do it for domestic and then that's what runs on international as well because it's, no one has the time to cut two different versions of a story. But I definitely think that is one of the trickier parts of the job and certainly when it comes to the time differences and staying up until like five in the morning but then needing to be up again, uh, at 10 in the morning, it's, um, you know, we work very hard at CNN. <laughs> Anonymous attendee, mm. clearly you say TV is a visual medium and that you are either telegenic or not. Do you think with the way we're getting politically correct about everything, that soon it won't, be, won't matter if you are tele te telegenic for a visual medium or not? 
and if you have the broadcast voice for it like you do or not and how may it may it damage or not this medium Mm, okay, that's really interesting. I mean, here's what I would say when I when I say telegenic, I want to make it clear that like, that doesn't mean that you're beautiful or you're hot, right? There's plenty of beautiful people who are not telegenic. Um, telegenic means or, or maybe the what I am trying to convey even more than the word telegenic is somebody who like you see them on the screen and you're like, Oh, what are they saying? And you don't even really know. You're, you're, there's just something about the way they feel fill the screen and your attention. Um, I feel like we're already in an era where there are plenty of people on TV who are not particularly, um, that's not their big skill, let's say, or that's not their big asset. And I don't think it matters because they might be the best investigative journalist that the world's ever seen, right? And they're uncovering hugely important stuff. And as long as they know their material and they're articulate, it doesn't matter what they look like. And it doesn't matter if they have the classical broadcaster's voice or not. And, you know, with my crazy flip-flopping accent, I'm the last person to lecture anyone on what their broadcasting voice should sound like. But um, so I do think, yeah, we're, we, things are changing. I think that's for the better. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have those people on TV any longer who are natural um, presences in on TV or on screen. No, of course, the, the, there should still be a space for that, but it shouldn't be the only criteria. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, very exciting that we're diversifying a little bit in that respect. Toby Fricker wants to know, during the petrifying 28 hours that you were trapped in Mosul, how much footage did you film? How did you decide at which, what point- That's Arwood Damon, that's not me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Got... I would love to take quiet. But I remember, I, I think we were in Mosul at the same time, but I didn't see you and you were in a terrible car We were in a terrible car accident, yeah. yeah. So that was a, which was a totally <laughs> different situation. Covered Mosul. I actually, to be honest, um, I did cover Mosul a bit, but after that car accident, um, and it really was a pretty bad one, and you know, my camera was in a, 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 you know, a coma for quite some time, and he's better now, um, thank God. But um, I sort of, I, I, then, I like sort of took a step back uh, after that. I was sort of discombobulated by the whole thing, and I didn't really. I didn't really cover it again in a, well, and then I got pregnant as well. So then I couldn't cover it again. But the person whose work you're talking about, Toby, is my dear friend and colleague, Arwa Damon, who is an extraordinary journalist and one of the bravest people I know. And um, her footage from Mosul is, yeah, it's absolutely extraordinary. Right, Clarissa, I'm going to attempt to go to a okay. live question. So this is Chris King. Chris. Hello, can you hear me? Victory! <laughs> so, given that you started at Fox News, and given your thoughts about how you are thinking about neutrality and truthfulness, what <laughs> your opinion on Fox News's contribution to disinformation in the US? And the thing that's always struck me is that the word journalist covers a multitude of sins. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a really good question. Um, so when I worked at Fox, uh, which was back in 2002 to like 2005, and or 2003 to 2005, but anyway, I always felt quite sorry for a lot of the journalists there because the reporters at Fox were basically just doing their jobs, you know? And I worked in their Baghdad bureau many times and they were just telling the news and telling the stories. The opinion that you're talking about that is so galling, frankly, and, and so egregious and has now really meandered into, you know, pure fantasy, frankly, um, that largely comes from the talking heads and from the anchors which um, puts the journalists at Fox in a really tricky position because, as I said, many of them are perfectly fine journalists. 
who are just wanting to, you know, do their job and make a living. But at what stage does it become problematic to continue to work somewhere that is, frankly, as you said, an active party in this nefarious disinformation that we see that has become so pervasive? And I still know a lot of people at Fox, and I know that this is something they really struggle with. And I know that it's gotten much, much worse and much more acute. Um, well, particularly in the last four years. And I think that everybody sort of finds their own way to deal with it or to make peace with at least what their contribution is. Um, but I do think uh, I would also urge everyone to read my colleague, um, Brian Stelter's book, Hoax, uh, which is all about the sort of role of Fox News and the um, presidency of Donald Trump and um, frankly, the, you know, the dangerous effect that that's had on American society. We have another live question. Michael, Michael, can you unmute, please? Can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can. Far away. Hi, hi Rita. Hi, Clarissa. Uh, Clarissa, fabulous uh, talk, and uh, appreciate your comments on the book at the beginning about especially about putting yourself out there because I'm trying to crack one out <laughs> about the pandemic right now. Anyway, my question is this. Um, as you know, a lot of foreign correspondents are kind of out of position right now, stuck in you know, their home countries because of you know, travel restrictions, closed borders, fears by editors that they might get the coronavirus if they go out. And I'm seeing a lot of reporting done on the US election of reporters in their homes, not on the front lines. Now, do you have any fears that this might become kind of habit forming that assignment editors, seeing that things can be done remotely or virtually, will get used to this. And also a quick point, a lot of bean counters are probably looking at ad revenues saying, really expensive to do that frontline reporting. What do you, what do you think about that? Thank you. I think it's a, it's a really good question and it's nice to see you. Hi, Michael. Um, I think that, um, Look, my worry is, yes, absolutely, that um, particularly with organizations that maybe don't have a huge amount of cash, that they're going to be like, oh, look, we've now seen that it is possible for people to do everything on Zoom from their living room. Absolutely. Um, and that that will replace on the ground reporting, which I hope if there's anything people will learn or take away from my book, it's that there really is no substitute for um, on the ground reporting. So I hope that it will pass, but I also am very much aware that one of the big ramifications of this pandemic is, uh, you know, there's going to be a very sharp, well, we're already in a recession and it's going to be protracted and, and painful. And that means that news organizations are gonna have to make some really tough choices. And that means that maybe it is much more difficult to persuade people to deploy a team to Yemen or to Afghanistan to cover stories that we all know are really important and that many of us feel very passionately about, but they aren't necessarily on the front pages and they are very expensive to do those stories because of the travel, because of the security. Um, so yes, I think uh, a lot of foreign correspondents are right now feeling a, a lot of anxiety, thinking, where am I going to get the money to make my next documentary or to take my next trip? Or how am I going to pitch this story in an atmosphere that feels increasingly not hostile to that kind of stuff, but certainly eh, just lacking in any real uh, excitement or uh, commitment to that kind of storytelling right now? I have another live question. Sally. Sally, will you unmute? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, nowadays, today's media platforms, many of them uh, follow certain agenda. Uh, like sometimes they manipulate facts just to serve their uh, agendas. So as a girl, me, I really want to be in journalism world. So. So this idea scares me the most like um i feel like if i ever make it i won't be able to do, say or do what i want to say like have you ever faced something like that mm. when you worked for a certain media platform 
So it's a really good question and, and you're right to be scared about it because it's, it's a very challenging time on that front. Um, I am very fortunate that I can honestly say I've never had anyone try to tell me don't say this or don't do that or don't put this on air or don't, no. No one has ever tried to censor anything that I've done. I think censorship can often, honestly sometimes take a slightly less overt form, which is, oh, people aren't really interested in that story right now. Um, therefore, no one pitches it. Therefore, no one is telling it. Um, but uh, again, I can't think of an example where that has happened to me. I think when you're trying to decide where you want to start your career or, or, or what role you want to take on in, in, in journalism, it's important to remember that there, there's no there's no starting out place that is too low, right? I started out on the overnight assignment desk, which is definitely the lowest rung on the totem pole. And that's where you learn and, and that's where you understand the way information is gathered and disseminated and the newsroom is a fantastic education. But I do think you wanna be very careful about working somewhere that is like actively flouting facts or publishing misinformation. And, you know, I was just asked about Fox News and I have to tell you, when I went to work at Fox News in 2002, it wasn't something I was proud of, but I at least felt that the reporting was pretty straight and the opinion was sort of ghastly, but whatever. Um, if I was 22 now, I don't think I would work for Fox News. Um, even if I really wanted to get a job and get my foot in the door because I think that it's important for all of us journalists to be on the same page about at least being committed to, okay, we all have our biases, right? No one's trying to pretend that that doesn't exist. Um, that day is over. We're all bringing something of ourselves to the story or something of the institutions that we work with to the story or work for. But as long as we all agree to stick to facts, right? As long as we agree not to systematically try to undermine, frankly, really important international institutions that are doing very uh, vital work in this world, then I think it's okay for us to have a divergence in, in the ways that we tell stories. But the minute you're willing to throw out the facts and actively manipulate and malign and disparage and undermine you know, then it's like, no, you don't want to be a part of that. You don't want to be involved with that. Thank you, Sally. Um, Lily Wolfson also wants to know, how do you cope with losing colleagues who've died on the job? Mm. Hi, Lily. It's nice to hear from you. Um, hmm. You know, I don't think that that is something that gets any easier um, at all. I, I don't... I don't know if you do really find a way to cope with it. It's just awful. And it's awful whenever it happens and it doesn't get any easier. And um, I would love to say that you sit there and you think, well, you know, at least they died in, in the pursuit of this great and beautiful work that we do and, you know, try to make it sort of heroic and stuff. But if I'm being really honest, I don't think that that's the way many of us feel. I think we do all feel keenly what a waste, what a tragedy, what a senseless, senseless, awful, horrific tragedy or waste, or depending on obviously how, how, how the colleague um, died. So I think that it's um, an unfortunate reality of the job. When you're younger and you're starting out, you tend to feel that you're kind of invincible and you know, you're basing a lot of your experience on cool movies that you've seen or exciting books that you've read and you think it's all very glamorous. And the only thing I can say that, that can be important about facing death or confronting loss in, in a very intimate way is that it really brings home the, the, the dangers of the job, the toll that the job will take on you, the fact that there is nothing really glamorous about war, that it's horrifying, and that what you're experiencing in that moment is giving you 
just a, an inkling or a snippet of what so many people living in conflict zones are experiencing all the time. So maybe it gives you more compassion or empathy. Um, Albert Goldson um, from America, I hope I'm saying this correctly, from the Cerulean Council, which is a New York based think tank. Albert wants to know, how do you or your colleagues deal with the danger of increasing violent hostility towards journalists by governments, democratic and autocratic, and rebel groups throughout the world, not just in hot zones? I mean, you know, uh, I think, honestly, the, the much greater threat is, is not for people like me, who are very lucky to work with CNN and have a security team and have the you know really strong support of a very powerful network with global reach. I think the much greater challenge is for local journalists working in these places, whereby it's, as I said, it's open season on journalists around the world. It's okay for them to be imprisoned. It's okay for them to disappear. Um, they are taking extraordinary risks when they do their job and their work. And it's all well and good for us to sit around and pat ourselves on the back about how brave we are. But like, I, am I really that brave? I get to get on a plane at the end of it with my nice passport and go home, okay? This isn't like my full life. People who are living in many of these countries and doing the dogged investigative work on corruption and holding people in power accountable and uh, they are the ones who are putting everything on the line, who are taking extraordinary risks. And so my concern is less about my own safety um, operating and more about what we can all do as a sort of global you know, family of journalists to be more actively supporting reporters around the world who face much, much worse threats and dangers than we do. And that's why I think that the work of people like the CPJs is super important. And I think part of the responsibility that comes with this job is making sure that, again, you, you pay it forward and you, you raise awareness and you do whatever you can to help other journalists who aren't as fortunate as you are. Um. Right, we're gonna have to start wrapping it up and we don't have time for all the questions. Clarissa, you, I can't tell you how many questions uh, you've been sent. Um, yes, I'm, I'm so sorry everyone, we don't have time now to go through all the questions, but I do want to end by taking it back to your brilliant book and I do urge everyone to buy this book, especially by the way, we've had so many questions uh, from aspiring journalists mm -hmm. um, and for all the questions that Clarissa hasn't had the time uh, to answer read the book a lot of a lot of what you're looking for is in the book um, Clarissa I love to hear about those moments that are imprinted on our minds you know sometimes it's a person sometimes it's a place and your book is, fu is full of stories that really stay with you. What are those few moments that will never leave you? I mean, there's so many of them. I mean, that's the whole reason, it's funny you say that, that's literally why I wrote the book. Yeah. Because these are the moments, that's the reason you do it. These moments of connection, these small acts of kindness, these beautiful fleeting moments of intimacy that you share with people, from across the world, from completely different worlds to your own. And that's what informs or shapes the way you see a conflict or a place or a people. That is what really dictates the way you tell these stories and what moves you. And I so desperately wanted to have an outlet and a place for that. And uh, because it's not always the most dramatic stuff. It doesn't end up on the evening news. It's a simple conversation. It's a simple moment. It's my Arabic teacher. I mean, you asked me, I'm just going to go with one off my the top of my head. My Arabic teacher when I was in Baghdad and I was 25 years old and he was asking me to try to help get his family out. And, you know, as you know, we get asked that question so many times and it's, it's really heartbreaking because often there's very little you can do. Sometimes maybe you can, but, and he was, I was getting ready to leave and he brought me in this drawing that he had done. And it was of like a man and a woman like looking at the moon together. And it was, I can't explain it. There was something just so sincere and a little bit like naive 
in the way of this picture and, and it was so still full of hope and romance and it set against the contrast of this ugly occupation and this brutal insurgency and this destruction of a country. And I found it so moving. Obviously, there's no place in the world that I'm ever going to talk about this beautiful drawing from this beautiful man, except in this book. And that's why I wanted to write it. I wanted to share those moments because those are the moments that are human. Those are the moments of connection. And that's ultimately what I think really more even than the policy and the geopolitics, which is super important as well, but that's what I think captures people's attention. And there are moments as well, um, just before we go, um, where you show, you act well, you convey such deep understanding for people that, especially in these times now, when there's such a great divide between us, but you show such great dis understanding from people who, uh, we would perceive as enemies who, who are enemies, who are enemies to our governments, who are enemies to our culture. And there's this amazing story of your correspondence with a jihadi. Mm. Can, you, can you tell me about that? I found that yeah. really moving. I mean, Israfil, what a mess, what a mess. So I, I actually was corresponding with a number of jihadis, but Israfil was probably the best known. Um, so his name is actually was uh, Saleh Yilmaz. And he's of Turkish origin, but lived in Holland, was in the army in Holland, was a soldier and tried out twice for special forces, got rejected both times, fell into a depression. Up until that point, and had a very normal upbringing, was, you know, had girlfriends, smoked weed. I'm not saying that's normal, but what I mean is there was certainly nothing radical about it. Um, and fell into this depression had married this woman who had converted to Islam for him and he basically stopped talking to her. He became completely obsessed with video games and with the Syrian civil war. And there were so many young Muslims. I'm always trying to explain this to people when we talk about jihadis. There were so many young Muslim guys around the world and in the West who were just horrified at what they were seeing, this bloodbath, these slaughters on a regular basis and children being killed and no one in the world seemingly doing anything to help the Syrian people. That a lot of them did decide that they wanted to go and, and defend the Ummah, defend the, the Muslim people. And Israfil was one of them. And so he actually said that the moment that propelled him to go and fight in Syria was a Jehovah's Witness came and rang on the doorbell and said, you know, whatever the Jehovah's Witness people say, it's been a while since they've rung on my doorbell. But he was very impressed that these were like missionaries and that they were dedicating their life to their religion. And he had this epiphany that I need to dedicate my life to my religion. So he traveled to Syria, he left his wife, he started working as a freelancer, basically training different rebel groups. And then I made the journey into Syria to interview him at one point. And it was already clear, I'd been corresponding with him for five months, he was becoming more and more radical because of call, he was already extreme, okay? But then he was becoming more, more extreme. And there is quite a huge spectrum on, on the extreme spectrum. And he was more full of hatred, a lot more sort of ranting about the West. Um, and there were fewer areas that we could find agreement on, let's say. And then he disappeared. After this interview I did with him, he disappeared for like two or three months. I thought maybe he was dead. And then one day he turned up in Raqqa in Syria. And from then on, it became very difficult to even communicate with him because he was so full of hatred. He would say such ugly things. And he uh, he honestly became kind of psychotic, I think. Um, and, and desensitized to violence. It was all around him. He was seeing people killed all the time. He was getting shot at all the time. He was seeing beheadings every day. You know, what does that do to your soul? That erodes the soul. And even if you don't start out, I often try to explain this to people with extremism and particularly where jihadis are concerned that like not all of these people who joined ISIS started out as psychopaths or even sociopaths. You've always got a bunch of psychopaths who are attracted to a group like that. But sometimes you get people who are maybe not normal, who have struggles or an identity crisis or any number of things, but they're not psychopaths and they are drawn in by the allure, which sounds counterintuitive to us, but there is an allure. 
uh, for many of them, of brotherhood, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, a sense of, you know, excellence and protecting Muslims. And anyway, uh, all of which is to say that Israfil was ultimately killed um, in battle, or actually, sorry, not in battle. According to one source, he was actually killed by ISIS, who were becoming incredibly paranoid about uh, everyone at the time. And I just had this moment of thinking, what a waste. What a waste of a life. And God knows what lives he might have been responsible for taking and the lives of his family members. What an absolute waste. And, and I'm reminded time and time again in my correspondence with all of these jihadis of how mundane they often are, of how utterly generic and frankly kind of uninteresting. And this is what Hannah Arendt talked about in Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she talked about the banality of evil. We sometimes want to fetishize evil and, and make it so extreme and so obvious. And when you're doing this work, I'm sure you found this as well, Ramita, that like often it's a lot more mundane, it's a lot more insidious, it's a lot more subtle than that. And that's what's so dangerous about it. Yeah, evil people can be quite nice and you can have a cup of tea with them, right? And yeah. Quite boring. Yeah, yeah. Well, on the note of evil, Clarissa. <laughs> <laughs> Way to end on a high note, Ward. Yeah, let's go out for evil. Thank you so much. I mean, there were so many stories that stayed with me in your book. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your stories in your book. Everybody, go and get it. Um, and thank Aww. you so much for talking to me. To everybody who didn't manage to ask your questions, I'm so sorry. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Clarissa, thank you for joining us. Also, please go and check out all the events at the Frontline Club online. Thank you. And can I just say really quickly as well, if anyone here for some reason has not read Ramita's book, City oh, of Lies, which is nice. mind-blowing, mind-blowing stuff, um, please go and do so right away. I love you, Clarissa, because while you've been talking to me, my mum has been texting about how amazing you are. She's going to oh, love you even more now. You've well, heard. clearly she's <laughs> in excellent taste. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed our chat. And thanks to everyone. You guys can always message me on social media or whatever if I didn't get a chance to answer your question. Thanks, guys. Bye.